Good evening, my name is Inika. Um, I'm a bit of an outsider curator, although now I work in the arts. As Rachel said, my academic background began in journalism and photography before I studied law and was admitted to practice. Uh, that said, there are clear parallels in these disciplines to curating and their methods of inquiry and storytelling. I remember the Swedish curator Maria Lind commenting in a talk that being a curator is like being a journalist or editor, only you have more mediums, languages, forms to tell your story, a much wider range of materials to draw from. One interest is finding links between exhibition spaces and curatorial themes and anticipating receiving audiences. For example, as also mentioned, one of the first exhibitions I co-curated in 2014 was with artist Lodi Consalvo, who was heavily immersed in performance at the time. We invited 10 performance artists from across Australia to create a new durational work for the lockup, an old jail in Newcastle, and their work responded to the theme of contemporary forms of restriction on liberty, for example, social, cultural, political, and economical. After this, I did a project at the Macquarie Gallery. If you haven't been there, the gallery is set on sprawling acreage, like a large park with green lawns and established trees edging the lake itself. Eight artists contributed to this exhibition. The main theme was alternate ways for humans to engage with the world. The works ranged from the very abstract to the absolutely practical, between gestures in the landscape by Japanese choreographers Aiko and Koma to Greek architect Valentin Nakaga's rigorous engagement with the substance of living as form and contemporary DIY experiments for urban sustainability and Diego Bonetto's outdoor in intervention creating a wild patch interrupting the manicured lawn. So <laughs> that's some of the past and I wanted to talk about three ideas for future projects that centre on one shadow architecture, two, sound art, and three, borderlines. When I talk about shadow architecture, I'm referring to impermanent structures that fill spaces between <coughs> government-sanctioned architecture. For example, makeshift houses and market stands for street trade, pretty much the opposite of the organized German construction slash in this image. So there are overlaps with critical spatial practice, architecture as a spatial, cultural, social, and political tool. I became aware of these ideas while I was living and working in Berlin, which was also the time of the Arab Spring. A classic example of their manifestation was Tiger Square in Cairo. I'm currently working on a project that embraces ways to activate a space that could ordinarily be thought of as a non-place. The idea is collaborative, create and overlay structures or spaces that lend themselves to architecture to be activated regularly by talks, interventions, community-driven discussion. It's about how to see the city differently and how to humanize otherwise inanimate structures, keeping in mind the idea that a city without a street trade looks like an unfinished model. The aim of this project is to look at the potential of space and architecture, reinvigorating it with cultural, social, and political dialogues. <clears throat> the second idea I'm working on is the sound art of memory. What I've observed through my own experiences and watching others is that sound art sticks. It catches and suspends you, prompts memories, and provokes nostalgia. It can remove you from place and time. I watched and experienced this effect some years ago in a work by Seal Floyd. In a white room, tiny speakers played a reworked portion of a Tammy Minette song. The lines sung on loop were, I'll just keep on till I get it right. The, only, the room only housed speakers, nothing else, and it caught people for minutes and minutes. I went back several times and sometimes saw the same people sitting on the floor unmoved. I think one thing it comes down to is our oversaturation with images, computers, the World Wide Web. Sound art can offer a reprieve. It offers space and connects with the emotive side of people. Because of this, and because of sound's immaterial and ephemeral qualities, it's something I'm aiming to work more with in the future. The way earthly things are going, installed, pictured here and previously, had a similar effect as Till I Get It Right. In a very raw and primal way, the artist Amika Oberg caught the inherent struggle between what it means to be human in the way of the world 
the world has been warred, mined, and shaped for the benefit of few. I've recently started a conversation with Amika about the possibility of bringing this work to Australia, and I'm all ears if anyone has a space to suggest it. Thirdly and finally, for a long time I've been thinking about borders and focus points between objects and audiences, something that could manifest on, under infinite lenses. This image shows one part of a work by Adrian Villa Rojas, Theatre of Disappearance. At a talk of his months ago, he addressed this question directly. Why do we still distance ourselves from art? What is the purpose and role of art today? Where are the boundaries between life and art? Can they shift? Under a different but similar lens, I was recently contacted by an Australian sculpture installation artist, Seamus Heinreich, who's based in Vienna. Seamus is currently working on a series of sculptures that directly address the border, questioning what value we place on the border, why and how do borders or perimeters enhance or negate their surroundings, how do they drive our understanding of the world. This image shows drafts of large silicon frame-only works of Seamus's that droop and change over time, currently in prototype phase. By solely creating frame-like borderlines, the spatial center of the works will be equal to the outer territories. At the same time, the center will change through variables, including light and audience movement. The audience will both experience and create the anti-focal focal point. Thank you.